This talk presents a simple theory of humour. To get to the simple theory, we have to move through some complicated terrain. We begin with ancient texts, especially the Bible and Homer, and the ancient Near Eastern world that gave birth to them, especially Egypt, and then move to modern complexity theory. Finally, we'll say something about humour. The idea being underlined here is that to understand the simple joke, you need to have a firm grasp of the whole evolutionary project of the species Homo sapiens, and in particular of the most recent development with that project, high civilization. How it began, how it persists. This talk was first given on the 5th of September 2011 and is being given today on Tuesday the 8th of January 2019. From Homer of Chios to Homer of Springfield, underperformance is salvational in complex systems, or why Mr. Burns hasn't sacked HJS, a biophysical explanation of humour. Part 1, Literary Origins and Monotheism. Let me begin by reading two passages from ancient literature. Number 1, Now King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said to him, Let a young maiden be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait upon the king and be his nurse. Let her lie in your bosom, that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful maiden, Abishag the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The maiden was very beautiful, and she became the king's nurse and ministered to him but the king knew her not. Passage two, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. The sons of Japheth, Goma, Magog, Madai, and just skipping a bit, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put and Canaan. The two passages I've just read out are from the Bible, from exactly where we'll get to in a moment. Given that the Bible is thought by some to be a literary record of human origins, it might occur to someone to wonder, which of these two passages was written first? Is it the nice story of the old king and the literally hot girl, or is it the boring list of dead males? And the answer is, yes, the answer is what? It's a puzzle because from the perspective of Bronze Age archeology, span interesting stories only come after boring documents. The boring documents that do nothing but list kings, priests, laws, blessings, curses, land ownership, trade deals, palace pantry holdings, etc. But the puzzle is not without clues. The canny writers or redactors of ancient texts, well aware of which events preceded which in history, perhaps that should be expressed, well aware of which events they think should have preceded which in history, which is to say, well aware of that which should have cultural priority, are motivated to deliberately place literary material out of sequence. In a number of previous talks, I've termed this telling the story around the wrong way. Now, to the identification of the two passages, they are respectively the opening to Kings 1 and Chronicles 1. The positioning of these two very different passages, precisely at the respective openings for the two books, rather draws attention to itself. This is by virtue of the fact that the books of Kings and Chronicles deal with some disastrously similar material. Material on the Israelite and Judean monarchies. Because of this similarity, any difference between the two texts would have stood out, let alone the direction and agenda setting openings. There's a possible objection to part of this last claim since the opening to Chronicles is part of a text that has a rather dog's breakfast quality to it. 
so much so that in Greek it is not called chronicles, but by the very unflattering paralepomena, the leftover bits. With this in mind, it might be asserted that the material at the beginning of Chronicles is an accidental choice. There are a number of possible replies to this objection and to the assertion of accidentality. The obvious one would be that one man's dog's breakfast is another man's high art. But a much more worthwhile reply would be to point out that the nice story first boring list of personalities second structure occurs elsewhere. In fact, it occurs in the most important place, the opening to the entire Bible. The opening to the book of Genesis presents, far from a consistent account of origins, two sections on how the world emerged. The first is the attention-holding story of a god, a man, a woman, two sons, an ideal garden, a talking snake, and a few of the man and woman's descendants. The second account is a bare list of some of the first story identities in a rather curiously jumbled presentation of forebears and descendants. Here are the two versions of what seems to be the same list identifying Cain with Kenan, Irad with Jared, Mahujael with Mahalalel, Methusael with Methuselah. There's a slight change in the sequencing here. Enoch, Irad, Jared, en Enoch. And the big change is Seth, Enosh, all the way down to the back of the queue. So what's going on? Why is the seeming to be old text placed behind the interesting fictions that deal with the all too human flesh and blood characters? My answer is that the writers of the Bible have a cultural agenda. The agenda is an intellectual revolutionist's one of throwing down the pre-existing powers and the structures that those powers have established and insinuating their own. It's the device of fiddling with tradition to make it yours. In the case of Kings 1 and Chronicles 1, it is to place a Jewish hero, David, before the potentates of a more widely known antiquity. And in the case of the two Genesis accounts, it is to place a Yahwistic God and an ordinary man, i.e. Adam, before all those same potentates. So in summary, we are asserting here that the apparent inconsistency of the two co-located and unreconciled accounts of similar material, far from being inconsistent writing, or sheer clumsiness, the verdict that would be made with our canons of narration, are in fact an editing of the text tailored to meet the editor's deepest needs and desires. In short, the writing down of origins is a setup. Can we, who have a genuine historical interest, use the setup to our advantage? In one important respect, yes. If the writers of the ancient texts have a persistent habit of mind which involves placing two in front of one, can't we dig out one by a simple process of working backwards? Let's look, for instance, at the second item of the second slab of text to see if we can arrive at our true cultural origins. And what is the second item of the second section of both the openings to Kings 1 and Chronicles 1 and the two Genesis accounts? Seth. Let's consider the assertion that the whole biblical project is designed to subordinate who or whatever Seth might be. Let's begin with the name. 
Since Eve has something to say on this, let's start with her. God has set Shath for me another seed instead of Abel, Genesis 4.25. How convenient. Eve's pun in Hebrew translates perfectly into English. And there's a good reason for that. Many languages, especially Indo-European languages, contain a rendering of the phenomenon of establishing with a syllable like set. So in Greek, you have histemi, to erect or to set up, from which we get words like histamine, the buildup of a substance, histology, the science of organic tissues, and history, establishing the truth. I've written on the board some more of these which via various languages have come into English. Histamine, histology, history, stasis from Greek. Institution, constitution, state, status, station from Latin. Set, seat, sit, start, stand from German. And behind all these words is the verb to be. Is in English, est in French, ist in German, esse in Latin, esti in Greek. More telling, however, is that an entity, Seth, is well known to us from Near Eastern culture. He is one of the very oldest gods in the Egyptian pantheon, and we know quite a bit about his role in Egyptian culture. He is usually depicted as a wild animal, a dog, a jackal, occasionally as a pig or a hippopotamus. And he is associated with chaos, violence, and the periphery. I think we can understand his role in culture by first giving a quick sketch of Egyptian history. And please bear with me since even a quick sketch of ancient Egyptian history takes some doing. The whole story of Egypt is a south to north story. And I'll state in advance that in my sketch, that is going to be my theme. The Nile formed only about 14,000 years ago, so in about 12,000 BC. And people start to move into the Nile Valley only very late six to 5,000 BC. Very late, that is, by way of comparison with developments in the Fertile Crescent and Mesopotamia. Generally speaking, they are moving in from the west and from living around lakes which are starting to dry up with the desertification of the Sahara. They don't, however, move into the Nile Valley in a uniform way. They move into the valley in the south of Egypt and also in Nubia. We know this because it is in these southern areas where archaeology makes by far the greater part of its finds. In particular, this evidence is tombs and other objects involved with the worship of the dead. Why don't they move into the north? Here, the situation in Egypt doesn't seem materially different from that in Mesopotamia. Neolithic man is not adept at living in areas with vast and unpredictable bodies of water. Also, they do not like living in wide open spaces where they can be easily attacked by wild animals or indeed by capriciously predatory humans. And where also it is harder to defend their domesticated animals from such attacks. However, this aversion to living in the north comes to a rather abrupt end. And at the close of the Neolithic period, only one or 200 years beyond the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, settlement of the Delta gets underway. Mastery of water through canals and other water management techniques plays a role as do the new Bronze Age weapons, which allow for efficient defense against wild animals and the Delta, 
wild animals and the opportunistic human predators. The success of settlers in the Delta attracts the attention of the better established southern groups and then, as tradition so neatly sums it up, a legendary first king of southern Egypt invades the north and unifies what will come to be called the Two Lands with its two monarchic powers, the land of the sedge, the south, and the land of the bee, the north. I think this story is substantially correct, except for the last bit. The joining up of two monarchies. This is a shocking assertion because it is the first thing you will read in any history of Egypt. So how to explain the problem of origins? Like this. The notion that the Delta or Lower Egypt was some sort of second monarchy in Egypt in the late Neolithic and early dynastic period is based on four fundamental evidential elements with regard to the emergence of high civilization in the northeastern corner of Africa. One, the Nama palette, which unquestionably depicts a southern king, Nama, Mr. Catfish and Chisel, who is winning a victory over some marshland tribesmen and is then morphing into the king of Lower Egypt. Two, the idea of the two crowns of Egypt worn by a single king, which symbolizes his control over North and South Egypt. Three, the fact that Egyptians refer to their own country as the two lands, not as Egypt, which is a Greek word from a much later time. And four, the view that the divine agon between Horus and Seth plays some sort of role in a dual component to the identity of Egypt. Well, what's wrong with those ideas and their shoring up of the concept of a northern monarchy? The problem for the idea of a northern monarchy is that there is no archaeological evidence for it nor for a central site in the north where someone would be sitting wearing their northern crown. Beyond that, where is the archaeological evidence for warfare between north and south in this period? Non-existent. And where is the evidence for fortification of the north to defend against the southern invaders? Also non-existent. When you continually draw a blank on actual evidence, there is obviously already grounds for giving up a supposed fact. But the four elements also need to be commented on one by one. Number one, the problem with the famous Nama palette is that art tends to come after historical events, sometimes long after, and tends to be a rationalization, if not right outright propaganda, for the appropriateness of a much later state of affairs. Two, the propaganda related problem of the wearing of the two crowns. The double crown is not worn until the fifth pharaoh, Den, rather indicating that the two crown idea either took a long while to catch on, more than a hundred years, or was a retrospective fiction. Much more likely the latter, according to me. Now, number three, the two lands. The two lands as North and South kingdoms rather presupposes that ancient Egyptians have in their minds in the year 3000 BC, modern Google style maps depicting a geographic locale from the perspective of someone several hundred miles up into space. First of all, this is extremely unlikely. Cartography is really at least two and a half thousand years away. But much more important, the Egyptians description of their own country as the two lands is likely to mean something quite different. An Egyptian in the Nile Valley thinks that he lives in the black land, where the soil is rich from the periodic silt depositing floods of the Nile. The other land that he has knowledge of is to the east and west of this black land. 
It is the red land. The vast inhospitable regions of sand, desert, wild animals and some wild humans. The idea of the two Egypts has to be seen in the context of these core designations, black and red lands. In other words, there is an abiding idea for the average Egyptian that the north of Egypt is a troublesome peripheral area like the Red Land. And now four. At long last, we come to our special interest, Seth. The Horus-Seth duality needs to be seen in the light of the discussion above. The two gods, Horus and Seth, are emblems for, respectively, central dynastic control and a violent peripheral troublemaking group. This assertion requires some background and I will just give in barest outline the divine story of Horus and Seth. In the beginning, there were four siblings, Osiris, Isis, Seth, Nephthys. Osiris marries Isis, Seth marries Nephthys, keeping it all in the family. A struggle emerges between the two brothers, which seems to happen in origin stories of every civilization. Seth kills Osiris, cuts him up, scatters his body in the Nile. Isis, his devoted wife, retrieves all the pieces and puts him back together again. And Osiris then rules Egypt, somewhat paradoxically, as a lord of the dead. Osiris and Isis have a son, Horus, and Seth, the murderer, in what seems to be a judgment on his suitability for being a parent, has no children. Then the story just seems to repeat. Seth, Horus's uncle, either kills or abuses or terrorizes the young god Horus. As to an interpretation of the symbolism of the tale with regard to how civilization starts and then persists, we think that the rest of Egyptian history can give the clarification. So, back to our sketch. In the early dynastic period, the Horus name is by far the most unusual, the Horus name is by far the most usual for a king. And Horus names are being used as early as the acknowledged to be second king, Horus Akka. An interesting story attaches to this king. At his death, his body was carried away by a hippopotamus an embodiment of the deity Seth. And there is another version of the story, that he was killed by a hippopotamus whilst out hunting. This latter is of particular interest because in ancient art, the hunting of wild animals is almost never about the king being a weekend or vacational hunter, but is rather a reference to the fact that the king is attacking foreign tribes. So the story can easily be interpreted as a struggle between a central dynastic power and peripheral elements. Jer, the next king, is another with a Horus name, Horus who suckers. And there is a pertinent detail about one of his regnal years on the so-called Cairo stone. This regnal year is the year of smiting the land of Setjet. This is understood to be Sinai or even further north. So very early on, the king has a Horus name and he is locked in a struggle with a peripheral Seth entity. The extent to which this is defining for Egyptian civilization is that the tombs of precisely these two kings that I have just mentioned, Akka and Jer, have a special role 1,500 years later in the New Kingdom as, so to speak, Horus heroes. So as key figures in a special cult of Horus, and by implication, a special cult of anti-Seth. 
Next, we take a brief look at King number five, Hor Den. Horus who strikes. And whom does he strike out at? Continuing on from Jer, he battles against Bedouin in the Sinai. And during his reign, there is extensive evidence for both commercial and military activity in Palestine. He is the first, as we've already said, to wear the double crown. He is the first to use the title NJ-SWT-BJ-T. He of the sedge, he of the bee. For which a figurative translation would be king of the two lands, south and north. He is the first to have a granite floor tomb. The red and black colour of the granite seems to emphasise the royal claim on the two lands. And this Horus who strikes seems to have struck it rich. His reign appears to be the first that is really prosperous. His own ornate tomb, the first to have stairs, suggests it, as do the quality finds in the tombs of his officials. A further indication of prosperity is the amount of expensive activity at the peripheral areas of his kingdom, including establishing clear frontiers for the realm for the first time. So, wealth and a general dynamic, so, wealth and a general dynastic success can be equated with the move up to the north. Finally, in my snapshot of this early period, is the actual move to Memphis in the north as a capital for Egypt. On this tricky and controversial topic, I'm going to just read what Hallow and Simpson have to say. Page 218. Judging from the royal tombs, the kingship was centralised at Memphis from the beginning of Dynasty III to the end of the Old Kingdom. So, we can now make a summarising statement about this move in civilization from south to north. For centuries, southern kings have dealings with the north and then they finally move there. Memphis, the northern capital, takes over as the capital for Egypt and rule from there coincides completely with the idea of Egypt as a single entity, the Old Kingdom. And we can say more about this whole process how this whole process relates to what happens next and how Egyptian history unfolds. The Old Kingdom falls apart. Then there is an intermediate period, and then a second, so-called Middle Kingdom, emerges. And then that falls apart. And later on there is a third, New Kingdom. Now, why do the Old and Middle Kingdoms disintegrate? And what is it that causes the extreme turbulence at the end of the Bronze Age? soon after the heyday of the New Kingdom with the appearance of the mysterious Sea Peoples? Answer, nobody really knows. But earthquakes and the dislocation in the aftermath of seismic activity is thought to be the probable um, explanation. Whatever it is doesn't really concern us just now, but what happens after these disintegrations does. And what happens next, if I can borrow a term from computing, financial markets, and from systems theory generally, is that Egypt goes back to its default position. It becomes a rump state back in the south. And there is a certain amount of giving up on high civilization till at a later stage, in the case of the first and second intermediate periods, the South does it all over again, invades the North and tries again to fulfill its pro forma destiny. This is with respectively Nebhepetre Menkuhotpe II, about 2040 BC, 
and the brothers Kamose and Akmose in the 1550s. If all this can be granted, the role and function of Seth worship and Seth-associated potentates comes sharply into focus. Scroll back to the beginning. The picture as I've explained it with Horus and Seth is very clear. Horus is associated with the centralized civilizing power, Seth with peripheral groups and the frontier. But there's one very big problem. Seth is one of the oldest deities in Egypt. And when you look at the oldest archeology, span a lot of it in this area here, Quift, Quos, Nakada, Hierakonopolis, and the area that will eventually contain the southern capital Thebes, what do you find? Seth dedications and Seth worship. Right in a central locale for Egyptian civilization. Moreover, look at the two early curiosities of the early dynastic period. The Seth named Seth Peribson and Kasek Hemwi. Are these people outsider, revolutionist figures? Are they carrying out a theological revolution? Like for instance, that of Akhenaten so many years later? No, we know this because the reigns of these two pharaohs pass without any upheavals. There is no scratching out of their names on monuments as happens so frequently later. And the usual cult veneration of their memory continues for many years. How is all this to be explained? The answer lies with the origins of the phenomenon high civilization. How, like the Egyptian proto-dynasts, do you start a major civilization out in the middle of a desert with no great access to grain, crops, cattle? Where is the cash? for your monuments, your cult worship, your bureaucracies, your experts, your armies? The answer, gold. And more generally, the mining of precious metals. And where is this mining going on? Out here in the Eastern Desert. An Eastern Desert also that, as it happens, contains the two caravan routes out to the Red Sea. Giving these cities here an epicentral role in handling all the wealth and all the trade that comes from anywhere in the Nile Valley. and is heading out east. I'll just mention that one of the Seth idols discovered in this region shows him wearing a solid gold crown. What do we learn from this? Egypt in the infancy of its civilization was, if I may so describe it, one big, or actually small, west of Australia. And all these cities on the right bank of the Eastern Nile were all little Perths. And the relationship between center, the civilized Nile Valley, and the dangerous desert was a largely non-problematic, largely non-antagonistic relationship. Civilization can only function properly when a civilized center gets on reasonably well with its resource-rich periphery. However, at a certain point, a sort of phase two emerges whereby the civilization needs to expand. And when it does this, outlying regions start to have a better understanding of the game they are caught up in. And the relationship does become genuinely antagonistic. The Canaanite Hyksos adoption of Seth worship in the north is a first clue to how this somewhat ritualized political game-playing behavior works. 
Adopting Seth worship allows an outside group into the playing of what we might call the outsider-insider game, in which one uses rhetoric that says, yes, we are outsiders and latter-day blow-ins, but also we are the basis for your fancy high civilization. The next people to adopt Seth-associated identities in the period of the late Bronze Age collapse are even more revealing. The case of Seti II is particularly worth noting. In this troubled period where Egypt is coming under pressure from the Sea Peoples, the pharaonic power in the north under Seti II has completely lost control of southern Egypt. And so this pharaoh deliberately picks a Seth name to more correctly explain his position in the world and almost certainly does this in an attempt to co-opt some military help from his sea people tormentors who are already, who we already know are significant players in pharaonic armies. So much for my sketch of origins and Seth's role in it, but one final paragraph on monotheism. My take on monotheism is this, that this ritualized Horus Seth Agon feeds into its emergence because the Northerners are always demanding a simplification of the complexities of the South. It's easy to imagine how all this works. Take the case of the Hyksos. The Egyptians are polytheists and the Hyksos are also polytheists. But when the Hyksos come to power in Egypt, they say, yes, we have a certain number of gods in common, but you people down here have got cats, dogs, cows, ibises, hippopotamuses, crocodiles, bees, sedge plants. And so the Hyksos say, no, no, no. We're not putting up with all that. We'd prefer less or even one God. So the move towards monotheism, according to me, is a systematic property of the symbiotic agon of high civilization. The South has to continually expand outwards to obtain resources, let's say, to the North. And the North, or the periphery, is continually putting pressure on the South to simplify its complexities and make its great project more average guy friendly. Just one intriguing detail in support of what I'm outlining. When do pharaohs start to make the universalist claim of being associated with the sun disk? Way back in the early dynastic period that we've been talking about with Pharaoh Reneb. He has a Ra name, i.e. a son name. So only two pharaohs ahead of Seth Peribson comes the first demonstrable universalist. Just a coincidence? What does Peribson's name mean? Hope of all hearts. A very suspiciously democratic sounding name. In other words, the semi-ritualized dynamic of the politics that we so obviously have today even obtained right back then. With both sides of the Agon being able to claim that they had the single answer, it led eventually to Akhenaten's 17th, uh, 14th century capital S Southern project of a full-blown monotheism and led to, at exactly the same time, the 14th century, an explosion of single capital N northern national gods in the Eastern Mediterranean. Zeus for the Greeks, Yahweh for the Israelites, Shemosh for the Moabites, Milcom for the Ammonites, Hadad for the Arameans, Dagan for the Philistines. And ultimately it led to the writing down of a text in the sixth century, a Bible, which required a single God for the purpose of having a single coherent account of a purely biological historical process. To wit, the triumph of a single complex monolithic power and where we began, the subordination of Seth. Part two, underperformance. I'll begin this second part by reading a quote from an old talk of mine from 2007 on the topic of 
colonial fitness in social bees, i.e. hive dwelling bees. In large successful and efficient systems, be it in nature or anywhere else, some underperformance is often found. It might even be a defining feature. In bees, this matter has attracted attention from Schmidt and Hempel in 1987 and Houston in 1988. Whilst out foraging, bees adopt a sub-maximal strategy for acquiring nectar and pollen. They carry loads that are much lighter than they are capable of shifting. There are two reasons for this. One, on account of the game theory principle of making yourself a smaller and less attractive target for predators. And two, they are doing this because of the high energy costs of carrying loads, carrying heavy loads. With bees, there is a straight negative correlation between active foraging and lifespan. And dying early places a strain on the colony which expends energy on replacing the individual forager. And on top of that, there is the problem of the disruption to obtaining food. This second notion of attention to cost effectiveness should be summarized as the you're no good to anyone dead principle and has wide application in systems theory. A simple example would be if you've got a car that can do 200 miles per hour, you don't run it at 200 miles per hour. It'll start vibrating, the rivets will start coming loose and eventually the whole thing will clag out. This applies to almost any arena of activity that you can think of. Engineering, architecture, elite athletics, horse racing, and virtually any game. Every system of a certain size attains a greater value than to use a popular way of putting this, the sum of its parts. The effective use of the system is more worthwhile than anything the individual elements in it could achieve by themselves. So it's more important for every constituent element to work reasonably well than to have a situation where one element wears itself out with the net result of the entire system failing. End of quote. An intriguing aspect of our earliest large scale narratives like the Bible and Homer's epics is their strong tendency to dwell on the idea of playing a secondary role and on that role being conducive to achieving salvation, or in more recent terminology, conducive to evolutionary success. The Bible focuses sharply on younger brothers who seem disinclined to pursue outdoor or violent martial activities. It is to his cost in the case of Abel, but to their advantage with Jacob, Isaac and Joseph. On these latter, God is expressly conferring worldly success and the building of a great nation. Homer too displays a strong interest in this theme. Again, it is with a younger brother, Menelaus. Menelaus in the Iliad is a rather hesitant fighter of only secondary importance and is overshadowed by his martially successful older brother, Agamemnon. However, it is Menelaus who ends up in the Odyssey with the prize that had been fought over at Troy, Helen, and with enough Egyptian and other wealth to make him, at least in his own mind, the richest man in the world. His brother Agamemnon, on the other hand, after a great but short-lived success, becomes a victim of that success when murdered in his own palace. The underperformer of the Iliad par excellence, however, is not in fact Menelaus, but Patroclus, Achilles of Sidon. The whole plot of the Iliad dwells on the person of Patroclus, someone who takes on subservient and carer roles. First for Achilles, the principal fighter, then for wounded soldiers, and then as an emergency stand-in principal fighter for the Achaean army. After all these exemplary submissions, his death at Troy is celebrated at the end of the Iliad by way of an inspirational memorializing ceremony. 
In the Odyssey, it is Eumaeus, the swineherd, born of a king who plays the special underperformer role. Homer, somewhat bizarrely, indicates his particular interest in and approval of precisely these three personae above all the rest of the passing parade of characters in the two poems by speaking to them periodically in a direct address. In other words, he actually takes time off from his narration to talk to his favourites. I think it is worth noting that not only do our earliest large-scale narratives of the 8th to 6th centuries have this abiding interest in the persona who plays a subordinate role, but also that such texts are claiming to be set in or are about the Late Bronze Age, which we know from archaeology is not just the period of Akhenaten's full-blown Egyptian monotheism, but is also the period of all the emergent monolatries. We learn from all these considerations something quite profound. The move to monotheistic religion that took place in the deep, dark past of our evolution into a hyper-complex, civilized species corresponded with a change in the whole biological complexion or personality of our species. We became split into two types, a subordinated and generally flexible type of person, a gracile branch of the species, might be a way of looking at it, and a more violent opportunistic branch, the members of which seize on an evolutionary advantage opening up by the very fact of the existence of the subordinated type. This bifurcation of the successful subordinated type and the violent opportunistic type has, however, the potential for a ratcheting up of megalomanias on both sides on the simple principle of arms race, as seems to have occurred in the late Bronze Age with some rather obvious echoes in later historical developments up to and including rather notably the 20th century's world wars. Part three, humor. The world has been poorly served by theories of humor to date. If you go to the Wikipedia website, theories of humor, you will see that there are 11 theories. And extraordinarily, they don't include Freud's theory of humor to do with tension reduction. When the scientifically minded person sees that there are 11 theories, they say what? They say that there are too many theories and that by implication, nobody really knows. The omission of Freud's theory is truly notable because it is so close to the average person's idea of humor. In everyday life, there are expressions like, he just laughed it off and lighten up, buddy. So laughing and humor are about helping to keep things light and frothy, helping to keep tensions down. In short, there are too many theories and they don't even cover the most obvious one. Today, we think we can see off all the confusion and have just one theory of humor. To do this requires a joining up of today's talks, parts one and two. The agon between the people, who I call the southern civilizers, and the northern invaders, and the simple facts of self-depreciation and self-abasement in complex systems. Show us how humor works. Let's draw a diagram. In the past, I've described this barrier or liminal point between north and south as a simple line, which just moves northward in time over the northern hemisphere's landmass. Yes, occasionally when the northerners invade, it slips back southwards as happened for instance, in Egypt, as we have seen, but essentially just a moving line. However, today I propose that we think about it in quite a different way. Here's the line 
but up here is an outpost. An outpost for civilization. People may be familiar with how Mesopotamia evolves. The southern cities form a symbiosis with the northern city of Kish. And the term King of Kish soon becomes a generic claim made by even southern kings. It just means that they are claiming to have control of southern Mesopotamia, whether they live in Kish or not. Later on, a similar relationship evolves with a city further north, Akkad. So back to systems. What happens next? The outpost starts to have its own outposts. And then those outposts, other outposts. Until, what are we looking at? Those educated in modern science or mathematics will know straight away. Mandelbrot's fractals. The same relationship is happening over and over again. This line at the bottom is only notionally flat. It is actually the top of a big circle. How does this help with the idea of humour? Well, we need to borrow one more idea from science. The edge of chaos. Our liminal line is the edge of chaos for civilization. At the edge of chaos, things are transforming into other things. In physics, those transformations are more usually called phase transitions. They are not for the most part witnessed in everyday life, but sometimes they are, as when you boil a pot of water. What was once water becomes steam before your very eyes. What is the problem for the complex entity as it pushes outward to, be, to become even bigger? Enter underperformance. The civilizing entity can't abide, can't abide precisely at or on the edge of chaos. The intentional underperformance of the South can't be in a war zone. War, by definition, is about going hard. In war, moreover, all the forms and contents of communication have to be literal. People give orders. People obey. There is, to use a slightly technical term from military circles, word of command. Somebody says, do this, somebody does it and doesn't make any requests for qualifications, implications or interpretations. But there is an attendant problem for the civilized person at the edge of chaos, namely that this is where the evolutionary process that we call civilization is taking place. It's the only game in town. So paradox, you have to be there, but you have to avoid it. What is the solution? Jumping across the edge of chaos from north to south and south to north. Let's see how this works using that most basic of all examples in humor, the Rodney Dangerfield joke. One, the doctor told me I had to watch my drinking. So now I do my boozing looking in the mirror. There are a lot of doctors in Dangerfield's jokes. We have a couple more to come. The doctor is the expert. He is the one to be obeyed, the authoritarian. In our terms, he is the northern power. And here he is actually giving an order. This gives rise to a fiddling with forms and contents with regard to watching. And the southern underperformer, the danger field persona in this case, comes out on top in the agon between north and south by defying the order whilst pretending to obey it. The point here is that going to see a doctor and issues relating to a person's health can be a matter of life or death. But here there is an expression of the danger and a dodging of it. Two, when I was born, I was so ugly 
the doctor spanked my mother. This starts as a southern joke with the self-depreciatory I was so ugly, but becomes a northern joke with the vindictive spanking of mother. Again, birth can be traumatic and being unattractive can be traumatic and both can have serious evolutionary consequences. But here the crisis is dodged with another fiddling of forms and contents with the mother getting smacked instead of the newly born baby. Three, one last one. A man goes to his doctor and says, what do you think, doc? The doctor says, you're ill. And the man says, oh, doctor, that's terrible. I want a second opinion. The doctor replies, and you're ugly. In this exchange, it's the North that ends up winning. The man sounds as if he's prepared to abide the Northern man's judgment, but when the doctor says what he doesn't want to hear, he partially subverts the idea of seeking an opinion by saying that he wants another one. And then comes again the fiddling with forms and contents. The second opinion is given on the spot completely off the topic. So what is our theory of humour? Well, bewilderingly, nobody has ever noticed this before. Humour is only of two types, the vindictive and the self-abasing. Category one, the vindictive gambit, is when you are making fun of, deriding, or deriving pleasure from someone or some group's discomfort. This is northern humour. Category two, the self-abasing or self-depreciative gambit is when you are detracting from or derogating your own status or reputation or that of your family, your community, your nation, your race, your religion, your field of expertise, etc. This is southern humour. And all humour is a sort of byplay between the two. Conclusion. In this talk, I've tried to give an overview of the issues relating to the presentation of literary accounts of origins. We started with the Bible and went on to use the story of Egypt. How do you write the account? By exploiting the strategies of an outsider-insider game, whereby the Seth outsider, who was always at one stage yourself, becomes an object to be subordinated or suppressed in later times so that civilization can proceed along its inexorable expansion up to the level that you're happy with. Monotheism will always have a role in this process because both sides of the Horus-Seth dualism will be happy to take over and rule the other completely. Monotheism is really a phenomenon born of the desire for absolute power. As the civilization becomes bigger, the stakes become correspondingly higher. And megalomaniacal claims about your God, however you conceive him, it, become both sides, come from both sides, the norm. A peculiar aspect to, in particular, South's role in all this is the extreme submission to the central authority as it expands, leading to a phenomenon I've called underperformance. It is not just a matter of performing subordinate roles in a complex entity, but also behaving with a certain amount of caution and moreover exhibiting an abiding sympathy with one's fellow cogs, who all have to function at least reasonably well for the whole edifice to work at all. This whole analysis was brought to bear, however, to explain something a little unexpected, humour. Humour, very far from being, as is commonly thought, a divine mystery, or just wasting time, is in fact a fundamental evolutionary strategy for our species, which has been adopted in order to survive. As civilization expands, it runs into the problem that the civilized cannot live life precisely at or on the edge of their point of expansion, at that point where the war for civilization is being fought. As a consequence, the civilized person takes a great deal of care to cross back and forth between the two zones of civilization and not or not quite civilization, gaining a form of civilized knowledge. They are engaged with both a being at and a not being at the edge of chaos. 
They are crisscrossing that place where evolution is taking place, but where, if stationary, they would quite quickly burn out or be killed. A quick postscript to this talk. A word on The Simpsons, since a reference to that well-known TV show appears in the title. The Simpsons draws on a staple for North-South dichotomies, that of male-female. Generally speaking, the males are dumb outsiders, the females are smart insiders. There is a sharp focus on this within the Simpson family unit itself. The male principals, Homer and Bart, are the dumb male no-hopers, and Marge and Lisa are the intelligent female hope of the side figures. The males drive the plot with their crackpot or inconsiderate of others schemes, and it is the job of the females to push back against the madness. With a long-running show like The Simpsons, almost any hot topic can be up for dissection. But let's just take a look at one obvious one. Religion. And just one example. Lisa is struggling to enlighten Bart with regard to the allegedly lofty precepts of spirituality. Lisa suspects she is not making progress with Bart's soul but thinks she might make a breakthrough with a golden rhetorical interrogative from Japanese Buddhism. Yes, Bart, but ponder this. What is the sound of one hand clapping? And Bart replies without a pause. Oh, it's this, Lise, quietly clattering the tips of his fingers against the bottom of his hand. This is, of course, a joke about levels of understanding. And it doesn't matter what you think about religion for the joke to work. The dumb can't penetrate through an edge of chaos to the realm of higher knowledge without being destroyed as the dumb. But Bart jumps across the danger zone by subverting the concept, hand clap. A form has, by cunning design, deliberately failed to have its usual content. Bart both does and does not hurdle the great divide between idiotic literalism and difficult abstraction. Thanks.